Angie is on vacation, well deserved vacation, and will not be joining us today. So um, I think we're we're in good shape there. Yeah. Um, the second thing I wanted to share with all of you before we kick off with the agenda, before I turn it over to Bradley, um, is um, Tyler is uh, uh, leaving MDE uh, yeah. for a new opportunity. So he won't be joining us either because uh, he's in his transition out of MDE. So I just wanted to make sure that this group uh, hear that directly and then uh, before we get going. So with that, in the interest of time, I know we have a busy agenda today, including uh, um, a, a panel presentation that I'm looking forward to. I hope you all are looking forward to it. I will turn it over to Bradley uh, to just go through the agenda. And uh, hopefully you saw some of the things he sent out yesterday. And Bradley, over to you, my friend. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we have a very exciting agenda today. Um, we're going to be, uh, first off, my favorite part, going to be doing roll call. Um, the second part, we're going to be doing a materials panel. Um, and that is going to include um, representatives uh, for our uh, various different recyclable materials to get their perspective on some of the um, challenges and opportunities and hurdles that uh, would need to be overcome to have uh, a successful EPR uh, program in the state of Maryland. Um, then we're going to be given an update on our needs assessment. And then the presentation that I sent to everyone uh, or to the, to the council members um, last night that is intended to be the basis or the foundation for our policy discussion over the next uh, over the next two months, uh, and to help inform any uh, future legis legislation. So, as we stated before, we're going to be starting off with the third reader uh, of SB two twenty two because that's where. Uh, before all of the changes to SB 222, that's where negotiations left off. Um, we're not proposing that that is the version that should be implemented in the state of Maryland, but that is a um, good starting place since there was a lot of thinking that went in um, to that version from multiple different stakeholders. Um, and then we will uh, open to the public. Any questions on that? Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Without further ado, uh, let's get right into our panel. Um, I will let the panelists um, introduce themselves. I did hear uh, that Delphine was not going to be here uh, uh, today. She had a last minute issue at work. Um, and we will start off with Scott the Fife. And it, if anyone hasn't worked with uh, Scott the Five. He is, as they say, a glass act. <laughs> Thank you very much, Riley. Um, I've put up behind me a visual. Uh, since we don't have time for uh, slide decks, I've got a lot of data to share with you on uh, glass in Maryland and our views on EPR uh, going forward. But this would have was going to be, I, hopefully you can see my background screen. Bradley, I don't know if you can. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Glass, all right. So the number one thing with glass in recycling, this is what source separated streams look like. This is bottle build glass from a bunker in California. This is the contamination from a single stream glass stream, the commodity stream. When we talk about commodity values and how it, the, the material needs to be cleaned up to turn into reusable, recyclable material. This is from Maryland. This is from one of the jurisdictions in Maryland that does recycle its single stream glass. Behind me, in the middle, this is what glass needs to look like when it becomes something else. This is cullet. This is amber cullet in a bunker after being cleaned, flint cullet in a, in a bunker uh, being cleaned. So you've got to get this or this to this 
Okay, that's my visual. And the rest of what my, my conversation will be about is the data that we have on glass in Maryland. Um, we think that there is about 275,000 tons of glass generated in Maryland. Uh, we believe that due to our data uh, and Maryland data that uh, less than half of that is, is being recovered, not let alone recycled into something else, but recovered. Uh, and we believe that EPR can increase that uh, by uh, another 57%, but EPR with a deposit return that would be an option to build into the program could increase that by an additional 83,000 tons a year of glass recovered in the state of Maryland. Um, we know that there are nine jurisdictions reporting that they are recycling glass and sending it to benefic beneficiation. While we do not have a full glass plant in Maryland, there are three in Pennsylvania. There is one in Southern New Jersey. There are two in um, Virginia that are all reachable and servable as end markets for recycled glass containers in from Maryland glass. There are also two fiberglass facilities nearby, let alone all of the other uh, and down market um, uses for glass, aggregate filtration, pozzolan, um, foam glass aggregate, things of that nature. Um, Thank you. Uh, most of the, uh, the, the key thing, Bradley, that I wanted to, to talk about is the contamination and from the different streams. Uh, and we have data, uh, we have pulled, actually gone in and done analysis of the material that is being pulled from the Maryland jurisdictions uh, on the quality of the material, because um, I can't show you my maps and things of that nature. Um, the, the data on uh, the contamination levels from the different uh, means of collecting the glass in Maryland, single stream, without any, this picture over here, without any, before any pre-clean. And what I mean by that is just a vacuum and trommel uh, before the glass leaves the MRF. You, this is familiar to, to the Colorado conversation. If a MRF does not have its own pre-cleaning thing, the very last thing that a single stream MRF can do is take all the small, try to take as much of the small fraction out before it leaves and then goes to glass processing. No other commodity material has to deal with 50% non-material non, -resi non residue. Um, the typical uh, level of contamination for non-glass residue uh, from single stream can range from 40 to 50%. That, and then you have small, Fines that happen after the glass is crushed, that can be 20%. So you can get loads of what the glass commodity is supposed to be from single stream recycling that are less than half usable colored glass to create bottles. You can use uh, the fines for fiberglass, you can use the fines for pozzolan and aggregate markets and things of that nature. But if we were collecting it in a cleaner stream, then more of it would be available to all of the end markets. Less of it would be uh, destined for landfills as residual contamination. Um, when you apply, there is a MRF in Maryland that has applied um, cleanup at the very end of the process, added on uh, small fraction cleanup, and that has reduced the contamination down to single digits of non-glass residue with an additional 15 to 20% fines. So you go from something that's less than half usable cullet glass for bottles to something that is 75% usable cullet glass for, pot, um, for bottles. The, the, we visited the Montgomery County MRF. The Montgomery County MRF is dual stream without any additional equipment for small fraction cleanup because there's less small fraction at the Maryland, at the Montgomery County dual stream MRF. 
you get an average of 15 to 20 percent non-glass residue and fines in the stream from the Montgomery County MRF. So quality, you will hear me talk about quality whenever we start to discuss the legislation. Quality of the end market material is very critical in the glass market. The cleaner that the material is, the more end markets and the higher the value of the glass. There are places that need it within reach of Maryland. We would love, the industry would love to build facilities in Maryland. One of my members is preparing to expand his facility in Maryland so that he can handle more of the glass that would be generated from the EPR program. Lastly, just one more visual pitch. Um, we believe strongly that um, a deposit return system complements EPR, especially when the legislation is going to rely mostly on the existing infrastructure most of the in existing infrastructure is single stream recycling. We believe that there needs to be some separation of the streams for certain material. It benefits the producers, it benefits the end markets, and it increases the recycling rate of the state's uh, glass in the program. Um, and lastly, uh, recently, and Pete, I don't, please, this is not anything, this is just our, our current position. It's been our position. Uh, we believe that the, the legislation should allow for an additional PRO to manage um, some of the separate streams or things that need to be managed differently from the bulk of the, the paper and the plastic products that need to go in, especially if there is a deposit return system uh, that is allowed to be put in place. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, that and uh, so thank you, Scott. You actually answered our first question, uh, which talked a little bit about uh, hurdles. Uh, so maybe as we're uh, walking or uh, uh, going through the uh, different folks, um, we can have them talk about the challenges and um, things that we need to be uh, potentially implemented to make EPCR successful for their particular um, recyclable material. Uh, we have one quick question and then uh, we'll move on because we're going to try to fit this into the first hour of this panel. Okay. Ellen, you had a question? No, just a clarification, um, you know, um, uh, to get out there that the um, legislation, you, you know what, I, I'm going to pass. I'm, I'm walking through a hotel, but you indicated that um, you know, that EPR and infrastructure, we haven't really built out what the EPR system is going to be used for the money. So I agree. Um, counties should look at uh, trying to get cleaner streams. I, I just want to make a distinction between this isn't, this is EPR really not, you know, we don't know how bottle deposits interplay with Ellen, EPR it, yet in this okay. system. Thank you. Uh, Ellen, we believe that a bottled deposit can fit within an EPR program. I was allowed to give my presentation on what the glass industry thinks, and that's what I was suggesting. We have data Appreciate that can show it. you. Thank you. We have data that can show you that we'll recover more, and it will have higher value and have more end markets. All right. Uh, well, thanks for that. Um, we will go, uh, since uh, Delphine isn't here, we will go to Abigail Stein with the American Forest and Paper Association. Um, and if you can talk about some of the challenges, opportunities, hurdles um, that face your particular recyclable um, material, um, especially as it relates to implementing an EPR program. Sure, um, I'll do my best. Thank you all. Can you all hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. So, hello everyone, um, Abby Stein with the American Forest and Paper Association. I am the Executive Director of Recovered Fiber, um, and we are the National Trade Association representing pulp, paper, packaging, and so on for the forest products industry. Um, I'm also a Maryland resident. I live in Montgomery County, so I benefit from uh, a pretty great uh, recovery program already. 
Um, in Maryland, the forest products industry employs nearly 6,000 individuals and facilities that produce packaging, sales displays, um, tissue, corrugated boxes, um, with an annual payroll of over 374 million. Um, sorry, uh, if folks aren't on mute, um, I'm gonna get distracted thinking someone's asking me a question, thank you. A um, Couple of quick facts about uh, paper recycling. Um, it's an environmental success story, no matter how it's being measured. It's one of the most widely recycled materials in America and paper recycling rates in the US have consistently increased in recent decades. In fact, the paper industry recycles nearly 70% more paper today than it did in 1990 when our industry set its first recycling rate goal. Um, we know, for example, um, in calendar year 2023, um, U.S. pulp paper and paperboard mills consumed 31.3 million tons of recovered paper to manufacture new products, and the U.S. exported another 14.8 million tons for use in manufacturing new pulp paper and paperboard around the world. Um, so that's sort of our historical commitment, and we're not stopping there. The paper industry is working to capture even more paper from the waste stream for recycling. Since 2019, our industry has announced or is expected to complete products by 2025 that will use more than 9 million tons of recycled paper. Those projects include building new mills, converting or expanding existing mills, updating machinery and equipment, and so on. Um, so this is an ongoing commitment by our industry. Um, because we have this demonstrated and measurable record of success in making our packaging and our paper more circular and sustainable, um, we care a lot whenever any program is um, contemplating changes to their uh, recovery systems. Um, <clears throat> for a highly recycled material like paper um, with widely accessible collection programs, robust and resilient end markets, um, an underdeveloped or underconsidered EPR program um, is always something that uh, is, is going to make us concerned and want to be engaged. Um, we believe that data, lots of information, backing up the decisions that are being made in these processes to be incredibly important. Um, otherwise, they have the potential to disrupt efficient and successful paper recycling streams. Um, in the course of chasing, um, you know, improvements to less effective streams. Um, and mandating fees on um, some of these products uh, is going to increase costs uh, with the potential for um, unfair results. When we get into, um, you know, and we say that because we're committed to this and our industry is one that's been um, thinking seriously and committed to the recycling process for decades. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're a part of these discussions um, while acknowledging, you know, the, the potential uh, hazards or things that make us nervous about the dialogue as well. So when we're thinking about specific recommendations, um, identifying and supporting best practices is incredibly important and is where the needs assessment um, is crucial. Um, eliminating single stream recycling programs we consider to be incredibly important. Um, they still exist in parts of Maryland um, and effectively communicating local recycling guidance. Um, communities in Maryland um, that have good recycling programs have great tools, but the communication of that to the public or understanding the difference when you cross county lines or even city lines can be pretty confusing and that can result in either recycling incorrectly or sending it to the trash because they're not sure what to do. Um, jumping back to maximizing the use of available data between what's ongoing with the needs assessment, but also some of the waste studies um, that have been underway for years in Maryland, there's lessons to be learned about what's working and what isn't working and making sure we're not investing money in programs and structures that just don't work needs to be a serious consideration. And it, that data needs to be fully analyzed and taken in um, as, a, you know, in advance of drafting language, not sort of, well, we're most of the way there and um, going in that direction. One of the other really big concerns that the paper industry has is related to mandates for post-consumer content in fiber-based packaging and materials. Um, for the paper industry that doesn't do 
um, what folks seem to think it does. Recovered fiber markets are complex, they're efficient, they're dynamic, and um, specifying the use of where recycled fibers go um, or how it is to be used in different products does not result in more of it being used. We are using as much as being captured and we want it to go to the highest, most efficient, best use as opposed to it being mandated to be in certain materials, which could actually in some ways um, artificially lower the value of it because it's going to a less valuable product. Um, rather than in driving increased paper recycling, um, it can make it less efficient. Um, it could also raise the cost of production for certain new products and narrow available choices. Um, one of the other things is that we uh, would like to make sure that when we're contemplating, um, you know, where the programs are structured, um, we think it's important that industrial, commercial, institutional is not included in the program. Some of the language in 222 um, and in the needs assessment point to only items sold at physical retail locations, but in other parts, tertiary packaging is included. And I don't know if wood pallets and things like that are necessarily expected to be a part of this program, but they can be unintentionally included when language like that is included. Um, you know, the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, when we're thinking about an incredibly complex system like recycling, um, there are a lot of um, different places that it goes through. And so when um, we're talking um, about the recovery, um, my industry, my members are mostly the end markets. They're the ones that are, um, you know, receiving what has been collected, what has gone through the haulers, what has gone through the MRF or the transfer station, what has gone through sorting. They're the ones that are receiving it at the end once it's gone through collection and sortation. And so the fiber that's then received needs to be in, or what, the, what my members would like is the best possible quality. So ways of eliminating contamination, whether that's adhesives or things that can mess up um, the machinery, um, that's another import, important facet that, you know, is hard to capture in some studies, but is, is still worth keeping in mind in these discussions. I think I've gone over my time, so I'll stop there, but lots to say. I hope this is helpful. <laughs> no, it's it is all good. Um, and uh, it just as another uh, comment after uh, the legislative session, um, we're planning on having um, some more frequent meetings. So there will be plenty of opportunities uh, to uh, bring in uh, everyone's perspective for that. So, um, cool. All right. Let's go over to, uh, I'll go over to Alex Trulove uh, with BPI. Alex, are you online? And he doesn't look like he's on, online here. Yeah, I think he accepted the invite. Um, maybe we can go uh, to, hold on, let me just bring up the agenda, uh, to Kate Bailey uh, with the Association of Plastic Recyclers. Thank you, Bradley, and thank you everyone for having me and giving me the opportunity to talk about the plastics perspective on EPR. My name is Kate Bailey. I'm the Chief Policy Officer for the Association of Plastic Recyclers. We are the only North American association focused exclusively on how we improve the recycling for plastics. Our members buy the bales from the MRF and recycle those bottles, milk jugs, yogurt containers, wash them, grind them to produce plate, flake and pellet, which is then used to manufacture new plastics products and packaging across the country. So we are essentially one step down from many of your community programs. APR represents over 90% of the processing capacity in the US and Canada. Uh, while many plastics were at one point sent overseas for processing, more than 90% of plastics are now processed in North America. 
And the short story is we need more plastics in collection programs. We simply cannot recycle what we do not collect. We have the built infrastructure to nearly double the bottle recycling rate if we can get more bottles in the bins. Um, so we are staunch supporters of good EPR across the country. Um, my job is to advocate for strong policies at the state, national levels, and even involved with the global treaty, EPR for packaging, bottle deposits, minimum recycled content are some of the policies that we believe will make the biggest difference when it comes to plastics recycling. Um, a little bit more about APR, we also have a globally recognized design guide. So APR works specifically with packaging companies to ensure that their products are designed to be recyclable, meaning we look at color, we look at additives, we look at adhesives. So really looking at you know the entire supply chain of how recycling works. Um, before I get into our specific materials, I also want to mention that in my previous role, I was the lead author for the Colorado EPR for packaging bill that passed in 2022. Um, so I have a lot of experience um, from that side of things from the local community side. But at this point, I'm representing uh, plastics recycling across the country. And there's a couple of things I would like to speak to in terms of how plastics are treated in an EPR program and things to keep in mind. First, plastics is not one thing. There are many different formats, there are many different resins. So it's it's something that has to be taken into consideration when we look at categories, when we set targets. There are different challenges for different materials. Uh, PET bottles, your water and soda bottles, for example, are primarily a collection problem. We know how to recycle those materials today. We have the processing capacity, seven out of 10, PET bottles in this country are either thrown away or littered every day. We're only capturing about 30% on average. So when you look at something like PET, it is about scaling recycling collection. Um, so that is improved access to programs, both single family, multifamily, and in the business sector, as well as dedicated funding to education. We know education works, it can help, but it only does so if it has dedicated funding so we think that's a key benefit of EPR. Scott and Abby both mentioned quality, absolutely key for us as well. Um, there's a lot of contamination in the stream, so both quantity and quality are key. So working with the MRFs, making sure EPR programs have quality standards on the MRFs to make sure that our uh, businesses are receiving good quality bales. And I guess the most important thing I want to focus on today is that recycling is a business. And so we focus a lot on the collection side of things, what happens at the community level. Our members take the recycled pellet, the recycled flake, and they sell it on the market to be made into new products. They're competing and replacing virgin plastic production. There has to be strong market demand for companies to buy the recycled plastics in order for this system to work. We can't just collect it and expect something to come of it. So APR is a strong supporter of minimum recycled content policies, either integrated with EPR or as complementary policies. Um, for example, Oregon requires a minimum of 10% post-consumer recycled content in the recycling carts themselves. We would think recycling carts already have recycled content, but sadly they don't. So there's an opportunity, for example, in the state of Maryland to help drive market demand, can give a lo long list of other materials. But I think the, the point I wanna emphasize is that we really both need the collection, increased collection of plastics, as well as a strong focus on driving the manufacturing uses, more opportunities to use more recycled plastics in new products and new packaging, and those that combination of addressing both the supply and the, the demand will help us reduce plastic pollution across the US. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Let's, uh, and we've talked uh, in, in some of these presentations, we've talked a little bit about it. Um, you mentioned Oregon, um, but what are some models um, in other countries, um, in other 
uh, let's say Canadian provinces, uh, which I guess is another country, um, or other states that you have seen that would work well with your particular recyclable uh, material. And we'll, we'll start with Scott on this one. Oh, Brad, thanks. Um, I would tell you that among the jurisdictions that we've studied, the most comprehensive and um, variety of systems that is used uh, that we know of in North America is in Canada. There's a couple of the provinces that have both uh, EPR. Glass can, and any of the materials really, can get, end up in any of the various streams. Um, in an EPR stream, in a bottle bottle deposit return stream, or a reuse refill stream. Canada still has reuse refill uh, primarily in the beer market. Um, a lot of the European nations have reuse and refill in the in the beer and the mineral water uh, markets for refillable glass. They're in a separate stream. Um, British Columbia has uh, glass in its EPR program and in its bottle deposit return program, and they're getting close to 100% of the glass material back uh, through the various through the various programs uh, when it's all combined. Um, and so we've been studying. There's there's no European system that we know of that has that relies primarily on EPR in a strictly commingled single stream system. Eventually, they realize that they need to do some sort of separate collection, not just of glass, film, plastic film, not to, I'm not the speaker for the plastic film, but, but, you know, there are some recyclable materials that just don't lend themselves to the mechanics of a single stream MRF. It doesn't mean that they're not recoverable and recyclable. It just means that the way that the, the infrastructure, the equipment, the trucks, it goes, starts with the trucks, all the way through the equipment at the single stream MRF is not particularly beneficial for those streams. And to get the quality up and to incentivize consumers to put the material in the right place, sometimes you need extra incentives like bottle deposits to, to get the highly recyclable stuff back in separate streams to boost your numbers. And so the comp ultimately a combination of modalities is gonna produce a higher recovery rate a higher recycling rate, um, you know, for the state and uh, for the state's goals. Thanks, Scott. This is Mike Okora for, let me just uh, build on some of the comments you made. And by the way, I think uh, both you, Kate and uh, Abby, you make a very good point. Um, but just so you were clear, uh, I'm going to cite the latest evolution in France. They've gone to two streams, glass separate in a, a black bin and everything else in a yellow bin, everything else. And you know, their success rate is exemplary. I think as Norway is the only country that is more successful you know, in terms of percentages than them. But that's what they've done. They've separated glass, everything else together. And they are seeing significant improvement in their recycling system. So I think that, uh, that's something I, I want to make sure that is clear. The rest of them, they put together and they're able to sort them between um, using, you know, optical sort of, these people are so advanced, they're mechanized, of course, uh, with technology. Between that and magnetic uh, uh, enabling, you know, uh, capabilities, they're able to recycle significantly higher. And they've been doing this for some time, but they just implemented the point I'm making a year ago, and they are seeing significant successful results. So that's a point to note. But uh, for the most part, I think what you talked about Canada is true because we're also involved there. So let me pass it back to uh, to uh, either Abby or Kate. Sure. Well, um, you know, I, I well, I have to admit, I'm I'm not as familiar with the, um, the French um, recovery systems. You know, I think that um, there's always going to be that 
when you hit a certain level of complication in the process, you're going to have some falling off in engagement where, you know, in, in various parts of Maryland, if you go to a drop-off center and you have to sort into a whole lot of different bins, um, not everyone's going to give that commitment. Um, but if you have it in fewer choices, that can make folks more willing to do it when it's at home. Um, you know, I think that, you know, dual stream areas in Maryland do benefit from uh, better recycling, better recovery, less contamination, which means that the bales that are coming out of those sorting facilities are a higher quality and they're able to sell it more and have a better chance of recouping, you know, some of their costs. Um, whether it's glass is separate from everything else or some other configuration, I think that's where um, some of this research that's that's underway in Maryland becomes incredibly valuable because, you know, optical sorting um, can only do so much and not every facility has the same level or qual quality of um, equipment. Some of it's kind of older, you know, some of the locations in Maryland are 2D versus 3D, which is another factor, not to mention the size of different types of packaging can result in things that are smaller, not making it through. Um, but, you know, I think that if nothing else, what I'm taking away from what you mentioned is that, um, you know, getting rid of single stream and, and having some separation does result in, in positive. And I think it, the, I'm not an economist, um, but I think there can be returns um, from that additional commitment being made. Yeah, and uh, just to uh, follow up on that, um, one of the reasons why we actually went to the Montgomery County MRF um, is because it has some of the older um, technology out there and there are opportunities for upgrades there. Um, we weren't necessarily highlighting that it was a dual stream, but it was more that it was uh, that it was using some of the older, um, definitely more manual um, technologies that are out there. So um, <laughs> I see Chad is elated. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's uh, th there's definitely there's definitely a huge opportunity for investing um, in the system with this. And then uh, with that being said, I'll uh, Kate, we'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. I think you'll hear many common threads with Abby, Scott, and I, and I think one of them is recycling is not one thing in one place. So this really is about how do we get at least, you know, how do we start making more improvements across the system that will look different in different places, it will look different for different materials. There is a lot we can do to standardize. We hear a lot of common calls for can there be one list across the region. Um, so I really want to emphasize that we see EPR as a process. We've learned from 20 years of EPR in Canada, 20 years in Europe, that these programs evolve, that things change. And so the process of the bill, the framework, is as important as the content is. How can you evolve with those changes over time? What is the role of the PRO? What is the role of the advisory board in coming back and saying, how do we amend this? How do we make it work better? So I like to think of it more as a, a living document, a, a living process moving forward, because we are talking about what is the next 20, 30 years of recycling going to look like, and we're just getting started. So I really encourage people to think about this as an evolving process and, and how are your how are you evaluating and improving as this moves along and the importance of just getting started and making those improvements uh, as quickly as we can. So a couple things specific to plastic, um, definitely there will be materials that are well accepted curbside. There are also materials that are better suited for a drop-off program, at least potentially for the start. Um, we look at the Oregon program, for example, that has a curbside collection list and then it has a depot collection list. Um, similar setup in Colorado where you have a common list of materials that will be included in all municipalities and then you have sort of like a little bit of an optional list because you might have something that's collected in Metro Denver in a curbside program but you might have something collected in rural western Colorado through more of a depot program. So there is a way we can balance some harmonized collection with some 
flexibility for different jurisdictions, different collection systems, different densities. So really support having you know uh, options for both curbside and depot. Particularly when it comes to plastics, there are many materials that are, uh, I would say, on the verge of being more widely recyclable. Things like thermoforms, things like plastic film bags, grocery bags. There are some programs. They will benefit greatly from dedicated funding, infrastructure, a coordinated statewide collection system. So it's really important that what we see in state policy is what we call an on-ramp and you know you're going to have a list of materials you're going to call recyclable as of today how do you get on that list in a year and a half two years three years what is the pathway so that the producers the brand companies will know once they hit these targets once they get this collection system once they get this processing that those materials can move on to the recyclable list so we want to have you know an ability for things to move the list is dynamic packaging design changes all of the time so um, that's an important concept for us um, i see martha's comment about design thank you for queuing me up on my next point um, california recognizes the apr design guide in statute as part of the definition of what makes a plastics recyclable so it's not just how it's collected the amount collected but also is it designed to be recyclable and i think across all of the materials and across communities we know recyclers are largely reactive to what's coming at them so design standards feedback on design are hugely important to make sure that the quality that's coming into the plants can result in the most amount of recycled content. Um, so I've hit on curbside and depot, I've hit on on-ramps, I've heard on design. Um, two more things I just wanna add, the importance of having goals and incentives, contracting clauses, multiple approaches to improve quality at the MRF. This can't just be about pushing more material through the MRFs more quickly, um, you need to have quality standards at the MRF. Oregon's done a good job with that. Colorado has it linked to their reimbursement at the MRF level. We have some current concerns about the California system where there's not a lot of incentive or even regulation on the MRF to say these bales need to be cleaner. And none of us can do a lot with dirty bales at the end of the day. So you know, definitely hear that theme throughout. Um, and then the last thing I'll just come back to is the need for market development, that these plastics have to be bought, they have to be used in place of virgin plastics, so we need to see commitments to growing markets, using plastics in new products, are there ways that producers can commit to buying the plastics coming out of these programs, can we use them in recycling carts like Oregon is proposing, so connecting this with either a standalone uh, recycled content policy or looking at things like Colorado and Minnesota who have identified recycling rates that will be set in their EPR plan as well. So those are uh, those are the key things that we see working well uh, in different states and countries. Something that, that Kate mentioned that I think is a really important point to expand on um, is, um, there's a lot of advancing technology and a lot of opportunity for improvements in the systems in the state and around the country. And so building a certain amount of flexibility and room for innovation and growth into the program is another really important part because something that is, um, you know, maybe has a low collection rate or is hard to sort right now or is hard to separate, um, you know, multi-material packaging as Martha mentioned, um, those are complicated now, but, you know, just in the last few years, we've had a lot of new technology come on and new opportunities come on to get more fiber out of it, um, it from our perspective. And so leaving room for that where there's not a cliff, which is, you know, something that exists in some of the other state programs where if it is not hitting a certain rate by this state, um, it's potentially banned. Um, you know, that's just going to lead to totally, um, you know, shifting investments in that material and not advancing it, but instead saying, 
this is not going to be our target audience. This is not our target market and shifting away. And so um, creating opportunities for, for growth um, in, in the innovation, I think needs to be a part of it too. And on both sides. So sorry for not raising my hand. Yeah, Scott, yeah. before you, uh, you before you jump in, I just want to make sure we don't lose a point that Kate made, and that is in the EPR uh, uh, law itself. And the idea is really important here, and I think um, you know, Bradley, we need to capture that. And that is this: as we go forward with on this journey, we need to be thinking about overarching framework of the law because things will improve, things will evolve as we go forward into the future. And that's really the key for this work is to make sure we have a framework that allows us to build in new ideas, new technologies as they, as they come. And I just give an example that just only a year ago did France go to this uh, two stream system, everything else and then glass. And that was a framework that allowed them to do that. So as we go forward, we need to be thinking about that. We don't have to enter every single thing into this framework. It's a strategic framework. As long as we have it so that we can build from there, that is what we want to ac accomplish instead of trying to build every little thing into it. So I just want to make sure I uh, capture that, uh, Kate. I think it was a very good point, that overarching framework to guide us. Scott? Yes, uh, thank you, Michael. I was gonna be I was gonna be agreeing with Kate and and Abby on 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 some of the points that they were making. I was gonna augment a little bit with uh, the glass perspective on that on things like recycled content. I think when we get to recycled content, it's very important to remember that each material has its own um, engineering, its own you know the way that where the recycled content enters the system, how it is calculated, how it is captured. Uh, the glass industry wants to double its use of recycled content. Our issue is not a demand problem. Our issue is a supply problem. And as I completely agree with the overarching framework, and I was also going to just elaborate on some of the, the questions that were in the chat from Chris about um, new equipment and single stream MRFs. And there are some great new single stream MRFs that are being built. We can get glass out of that. The bigger point that I'm trying to make is the design of the system for how you collect impacts different materials differently. And when you get to the cost issues, um, those need to be sorted out fairly uh, based on the way that we design the collection system. So the value is higher, uh, the cleaner streams of all commodities. I think, I think what we've seen here is that virtually every commodity would ask for better, higher quality material. It also impacts how you can use that material back at the end. So if there is an obligation on plastics, manu plastics producers to use more recycled content, especially in food grade to food grade material, cleaner material is an important part of that. It, the same as the, for, for glass, it's not necessarily a food grade issue that determines it. It's can we actually get our hands on it? Is it too small to put back into a furnace or is it, you know, has it been, um, you know, crushed to the point where it's so small that it can only go to aggregate or only go to foam, right? And so the the way that you collect the material will impact the way that that material, that recycled content can be used in the various end markets. Yeah, and just the one item on uh, the foundation, and then I am actually going to give Alex, Al we do have Alex online, give him the last word. Um, and then we can move on to our next uh, agenda items. For the legislation, we don't have to have everything decided. And none of the other states are actually doing that as well. They're going through their regulation processes. As the third reader currently reads, there's a plan that is gonna be submitted to the state, which uh, will have goals, will have uh, covered materials, prices, um uh, uh fees and financing and all of that fun stuff so we actually don't have to uh figure all of that out for legislative purposes um and as i said we're going to have more frequent meetings um to try and figure out what those details are going to look like and the advisory council is going to be able to um have some input 
on that plan as well. So I'm going to move to um, to Alex uh, with uh, BPI. Uh, if you can just introduce yourself and then um, go through uh, our two questions. Um, the first one: What are some hurdles, opportunities, challenges uh, for your uh, particular recyclable material in the, in an EPR world? Um, and then the second one was. Um, and I'm paraphrasing. The second one, uh, what are some models that you have seen that have worked well in other countries, states, provinces, et cetera, stuff like that? It looks like Alex is having technical difficulties with his uh, connectivity. You're on mute, Brad. Yeah, if if uh, Alex, if you can type up responses um, to some of those questions, we can distribute those out um, and even post them on our website as well. Um, you do also have the ability to call in if there are uh, issues. Yeah, um, I'm trying. I'm doing the old double mic thing right now. Can folks hear me? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, the microphone kept working, and then I was getting kicked off. I'm not sure what happened. I apologize to everyone, but maybe it's appropriate that um, I go after all of the recycling folks, since my presentation, I think, is a, a, a little bit different, as it applies specifically to compost and compost streams. Um, so uh, thanks, Bradley, um, for including me. I'm here with the Biodegradable Products Institute, um, which is the leading organization in North America for compostable products and compost systems. Um, within EPR, as we're talking, compostables are playing an increasingly important role in the packaging space, I think in part because um, there's a lot of research and development and compostable products are, are I think, um, providing certain packaging solutions for products that may not be eligible to be reusable or recyclable. Um, that's true, I think, for a lot of small format, multi-material, and certainly food associated and food and organic waste contaminated products. Um, so everything from food scrap collection bags to produce stickers to single serve coffee and tea products, meat wrapping, um, there's an interesting and varied list. Um, it's also important that these products uh, not just provide packaging solutions, but divert the food and organic waste or help divert food and organic waste. Um, we know that food and organic waste in landfills emits a ton of methane. If it were a country, it'd be the third largest behind China and the US in terms of footprint. So a big climate argument to be made here. Um, but as I'm sure you're all aware, even though Maryland has some really great compost programs, generally speaking, compared to trash and recycling, we have pretty underdeveloped collection. Most people in the U.S. do not have access to compost collection, um, whether curbside or drop off. Um, and so I think EPR represents at least one interesting funding mechanism um, to really include compostable products, but also support compost infrastructure. Um, I think for us, in our view, as it relates to EPR and good EPR programs that are inclusive, it really starts with inclusion um, and clear definition. So if you look at Europe and, and parts of Canada provinces that got started on EPR a decade or two ago, um, when the compostable products industry was still pretty young, uh, you see producers of compostable products that are paying into programs, but that money, their fees are being spent elsewhere on non compost activities. And I think that's what we're looking to tweak and what we have tweaked in some um, state EPR laws here in the U.S. Um, we see the spirit of EPR, hopefully we all agree, as um, really um, being to support the collection and processing of our different products. And they might be recyclable, they might be reusable, they might be compostable. We all have a place. Um, and then obviously there's opportunities to incentivize better design with eco-modulation and, and other um, mechanisms. So obviously recyclable or potentially recyclable products represent, I think, a plurality here. Um, obviously, as all the great presenters before me, um, I think it's important to include all material pathways and, and opportunities to make sure that those materials are also getting responsibly taken care of at the end of their life. Um, so whether it's being part of a needs assessment or within different funding categories or, or um, noted in different eco-modulations to incentivize design. It's important, I think, first and foremost, to just include compost and compostable products alongside anytime we're talking about recycling and reuse as well. 
Um, examples I can point to broadly, uh, I would look to statutory language in Colorado, Minnesota, and California. They're all different. We all know, of course, every EPR law is a unique snowflake, um, but there are elements of each one that I think um, really speak to what I'm saying here. Um, Italy, I think also as a country, has a more mature uh, EPR program that includes organics. That's really interesting. Um, really high organic waste diversion, high participa uh, participation, low contamination. Um, there's a lot that we've learned from speaking with our friends in Italy. Um, a couple specific things I'll mention within EPR laws as we're building structures. As I mentioned before, definitions are critical, especially for our world because contamination is such a problem and there are a lot of products that um, might seem compostable, but aren't. They, they use misleading terminology like biodegradable or decomposable or degradable. And that's kind of like a unique challenge for composters. Um, but there are definition frameworks that um, have really helped uh, ensure legitimacy, requiring third-party certification, focusing on eligibility, um, such that compostable products are really, again, des those that are designed to be associated with food and organic waste. We don't certify closed beverage containers because the other folks that have spoken on this call Kate, Scott are in that world and there's a good system in place. We don't need to um, contaminate it, if you will. Um, so that's important. It also may seem obvious, but it's important to us that funding for compost facilities are limited to the facilities that actually accept and process compostable products. If you're a yard waste only facility or you're a digester, that's fine, but you're not really part of the EPR program because you're not accepting the products that we're talking about here. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is because compostable products are kind of a fraction of the overall um, packaging stream and also a fraction of um, the organic stream, we, we share the stream with banana peels and coffee grounds and, and, and we're, you know, um, ideally only a small part of that stream. Um, the fees collected, generally speaking, cannot cover the entire system like they might in certain programs for recycling. And so what we've seen then is um, a more targeted uh, system for taking those fees and helping the composters that are, um, again, helping these compostable products and all of the food and yard waste that they help divert um, uh, to, to make the system more successful. So I'll stop there, but um, uh, thanks again. Happy to answer any questions. Alex, thanks. Um, just a quick uh, comment and maybe a question for you. One of the uh, um, issues with composting, as you know, we don't have that many industrial composting facilities in the U.S. Um, is really the guideline on how to compost. Uh, part of the problem is uh, people think that if you just get the thing, mix it with the soil, put it under something, it's done, which is not uh, the right thing. Uh, as you know, there are concerns about, um, you know, anaerobic composting uh, infrastructure by default. Because if you don't specify some of those things and you move away from clearly aerobic composting uh, setup, you're going to create more problems because you generate methane instead of CO2. And methane is a fugitive gas that is even more potent when it comes to damaging the environment. So have you guys looked into that to make sure that the guideline for aerobic composting is what everybody is doing as opposed to hoping that uh, it happens, uh, you know, by default yeah that's a great question i would say a couple of things um so our products are tested specific for specifically for aerobic conditions and aerobic technologies wind rows aerated static piles um we have disclaimers on a lot of products that you know um you know facilities may not exist in your area but these are industrial or commercially compostable products and that's where they belong and i think within epr there's also ways to tie that together where you specify what a responsible end market is or you specify what the applicable um facilities are and what what you know they need to do they need to be able to accept and process compostable products they need to make be able to make finished compost and meet all of sort of the industry requirements for pathogen reduction and everything that a compost facility already has to meet um, so I think that's very much uh, solvable. Uh, again, as I tried to mention earlier, for facilities like your anaerobic digesters, um, you know, they're they're really sort of separate from EPR if they're not uh, able to accept and process compostable products. So they they are generally speaking excluded from the system, and we focus on the aerobic composting systems that are actually um, designed to handle these products and make a gorgeous soil amendment that can then you know. Um, uh, obviously, um, improve soil organic matter and 
all of the wonderful things that Compost does. And, uh, and I think just to, to, to strengthen that, I think that's a point we must clearly articulate in, in the framework because um, anaerobic is just a no-go uh, for, for this type of program to be sustainable. So I'm glad you, you, you explained that, but uh, uh, thank you. But uh, stay tuned. I think it'd be something we leverage your insights on. Uh, we, we do have uh, a representative um, from uh, an anaerobic digester uh, actually on um, the council. Hi. Well, Benny. Um, Hi. Uh, Good morning, did everybody. You to, did you have anything to add uh, to this yeah, conversation? Yeah, I, I do. I have my hand up, and I appreciate you uh, preemptively calling on me there. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Vinny Bevavino. I work for the Maryland Bioenergy Center, which is uh, a food waste anaerobic digester in Jessup, Maryland, uh, owned and operated by Bioenergy Devco. Um, my question, Alex, is, you know, you mentioned uh, anaerobic digester is being uh, specifically excluded from the EPR framework. Um, our anaerobic digester in Jessup is the largest food waste recycler in the state of Maryland and has the largest capacity to process and depackage packaged food waste. And we are producing, we are recycling that material in our anaerobic digester, which does not you know, we're not a biosolids, we're a, sorry, I guess like a, a sewage digester or an on-farm dairy digester. We are a industrial food waste only digester located at the Maryland Food Center. I guess my question is, why are we excluding anaerobic digesters in the framework, um, given that in Maryland, our largest food waste, packaged food waste recycler is in fact an anaerobic digester? Um, thanks for the question, Vinny. Just to make sure I understand, do do you accept and process certified compostable products, or do you package, depackage, and remove them, and then only process the food waste? Well, we'd love to learn more about the process of like how uh, we'd love to learn about the fate of compostable uh, materials in the digester. We do have de uh, we have food waste depackaging um, equipment on our front end that does physically remove, you know, contamination, plastics, et cetera, just like many composters do. Um, and in fact, it, you know, so in fact, actually similar to how the largest food waste composter in the state of Maryland does. So I guess, our, yeah, so I don't think that we, yes, we do have food waste depackaging. It pulls out packaging and pulls out plastics, including because it's not, you know, that smart, it does not differentiate to the, to, to, to the extent of the difference between uh, typical film plastic and compostable film plastics, for example. But uh, yeah, but but we do, but certainly material does go through the digester and gets broken down and and we'd love to understand the fate of, of that uh, of that compostable plastics. Yeah, I appreciate that, Vinny. I think you, you've answered the question in a way, if, if you're not, um, accepting and processing compostable plastics and, and you're removing it all at the beginning, then you're sort of removing yourself from the EPR program. Like food waste itself is not a covered product. We're talking about packaging and making sure that packaging gets reused, recycling, composted. So um, while I appreciate the effort, the way I think your facility is constructed right now doesn't really allow you to participate in EPR um, because banana companies aren't paying food or fit, paying fees into EPR, it's the companies that are making the, the products and packaging, the fruit stickers, the food waste collection bags. Um, so if those are getting removed, uh, then there's not really a connection to the EPR program. If that were to change, and if, and if anaerobic digestion facilities could um, accept and process compostable packaging, and that digestate was then composted, you know, so it's not like they're isn't a possibility, but so far in the states that we've worked in, it's been a similar story where there just isn't that connective tissue um, to connect the packaging world and the covered products and their end of life and their management to uh, an anaerobic digestion facility. So I, I hope that's clear. And yeah, I guess uh, but I don't I don't quite see the difference between what I I, I I guess that would apply to anybody that's using depackaging equipment. It's not the it's not the recycling technology of anaerobic digestion that omits us from the EPR framework. It's that we are using food waste depackaging equipment on our front end, similar to some composting facilities, 
And anybody who's using depackaging equipment, you're saying physically removing packaging from, or plastics, I say packaging, but generally plastics and other things like that from the front end, which would also be omitted, you're, you, you, would, you would say, right? That depends on the language of each state, but generally speaking, yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of composters that don't use depackaging, or if they have removal technologies, they do it at the end after the compostable products are broken down. So there's a lot of different ways of managing a facility. And so if you're just taking it all out at the beginning, also, we're frankly worried about depackaging facilities introducing microplastics from conventional plastic products. Um, right. That's something a lot of our compost members are, are worried about. So, um, oh. so yeah, I think that 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 is would be generally true. At least that's what we have advocated for. I think the other challenge is, as I mentioned earlier, compostable products are designed and tested for aerobic conditions. So, I think there probably be some hurdles to cover in terms of really being able, I think as you were mentioning, how to study and understand what actually does happen to compostable products and digesters. Do they break down sufficiently? You know, can it be considered a responsible end market? So it's, yeah, again, it's not like a, a bias. It's just that that's sort of the way that the, you know, the world is constructed uh, yeah. right now. So, so before Vinny jumps in, um, we do have a pretty packed agenda. We're gonna have more conversations on this um, although I would like to hear from our producer responsibility organization who has is uh, talking about this with other states to see how other states are approaching this. And then uh, I'm sure folks really want to know what's happening with the needs assessment after that. Thanks, Brad. I'll, I'll be really quick. Um, we, we are taking um, in Colorado a technology agnostic approach. So anaerobic digestion facilities would uh, potentially fit in for those that we may be uh, providing uh, funding towards. So it's uh, technology ag agnostic. There is, I, I just mentioned as well, there certainly is uh, studies. Uh, I know that there's the Canadian government uh, along with the Ontario government did studies uh, maybe two years ago, looking at the, um, uh, the um, composting of, of compostable materials in different types of compost facilities and anaerobic digestion facilities. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, and definitely something we can uh, think about in the state of Maryland. So moving on, um, our uh, just to give an update on our needs assessment. Now, this isn't our needs assessment right here, but I think it helps provide um, some really good context. Uh, let me zoom in. Um, so this was from our waste, whoops, from our waste characterization study uh, that we did in 2016. Um, this is the breakdown of, uh, of essentially different um, materials within our waste stream. So the conversation that we just had right now um, is mostly going to be with this part, uh, addressing this part of the pie charts, and then for the compostable packaging, a small proportion um, of the organics right here. So um, as you can see, there's definitely a lot of uh, opportunity uh, that is uh, uh, with the potential uh, EPR program to essentially address this pretty large chunk um, right here. Now, some of these are like plastics that aren't necessarily readily recyclable or um, or uh, different. Uh, there, there are some nuances in here. I'm not saying that all of this is readily uh, recyclable, um, but this is where the opportunity is with an EPR program. Um, in this, we do break this down a little bit more in this uh, presentation and our waste sort updating this chart and this, uh, this report. Uh, we're gonna be doing our waste sort in the first two months of November. We have all of those scheduled, I believe, except for maybe one or two. Although we're just trying to find the best date because we have two holidays. Um, that are in there. So we we are um, uh, we are trying to figure out what uh, yeah we're, we're just working through some last minute logistics on those. Um, so uh, I saw your comment. That's where I was going next, uh, Scott. Uh, you must you must be a clairvoyant. Um, 
So this is where we break down um, this chart into some smaller categories. As you can see, food waste is our largest and most prevalent material in the waste stream. Right here, there's some other bills that are uh, that have been passed and are going through to try and address this big chunk right here. Um, but there's uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, of opportunity. So um, that's the update on our waste sort. Um, at our next meeting, which I believe is scheduled on the seventh. Yes. It is the seventh. Um, we're going to be uh, getting a quick update from Peter Blair with Jet Zero, and HDR is actually going to be reviewing some preliminary data um, with this uh, working group on the results of the uh, surveys and uh, and interviews that are currently being conducted and filled out right now. Um, I uh, distributed the questions for the municipality survey. I also distributed uh, the work plan um, for HDR as well. Um, as I've mentioned in previous meetings, we're going to be um, we're going to be going to even lower level detail um, in the waste sort than this particular report. And that was actually based off of feedback from this advisory group. So I just want to let you folks know that we are listening and taking into consideration um, the comments that we are receiving in this working group. Um, and in addition to that, I have 10 or so other waste sorts that various counties have conducted that we will also be um, uh, that we will also be um, uh, incorporating into our waste sort as well. Um, so uh, that those are uh, kind of the big updates for the uh, for the uh, needs assessment. Um, I don't know if Eric is on or if uh, maybe Sarah wants to jump in uh, on that. Um, I should note that we are going to be coming uh, going to be conducting um, interviews with the MRFs in the state. Um, composters and uh, with the private haulers as well. So there's going to be interviews um, and surveys there as well. Sarah, did, was there anything that I missed? Um, no, I I don't think so. As far as the waste goes, as far as the waste sort goes, um, yeah, we're just in the process of setting that up. It hasn't begun quite yet, but it's moving. Moving along well. Yeah, um, I see there's a hand up. Or first, Eric. Let's go to Eric if you have any updates. And Eric is the project manager for HDR. Yeah. Hi everyone. Yeah. Now everything that that Brad and Sarah are saying are uh, is right on. Um, just wanted to add, in terms of the additional level of detail, um, it we've expanded the materials list to include things that. Um, you know, we know we're going to want to be looking at as it relates to EPR. Um, and so, yeah, it, it gets into a much greater level of detail than what's shown here, but there will be a comparison done to 2016 as those categories kind of roll up to the same same categories that were um, evaluated in 2016. We should be able to provide some insightful data there. And then on the interviews and surveys, we are moving ahead there as quickly as we can. Um, we've made a lot of good progress and, and we're hoping to wrap that up by the end of next week. So we've been following up with counties, cities, haulers, MRF processors, composters, um, as well as other what we're calling strategic partners, which some some of those entities are are on this EPR committee. Um, so if you have received something from us, um, uh, you know, please be as responsive as you can. You know, we're doing our best to, to follow up diligently and the results of the needs assessment and the timing of our ability to complete the needs assessment in anticipation of, of developing the um, draft legislation um, will we'll really depend on getting as, as complete a data set as we can just in the next two weeks here. So thank you. And I should note on the municipality list, we actually reached out to all the counties 
um, and have a pretty comprehensive list of the municipalities that are actually handling their own collection. Either they're doing the collection or they are um, or they are uh, given a uh, contracting out for that. So we are making sure that we are, uh, it was much larger than I think what a lot of us were anticipating. Um, so uh, we we are reaching out um, to those folks as well. Um, I see Chris, yeah. um, and you're, you're probably a part of some of those uh, <laughs> surveys. Have you yeah, finished hey. your survey yet? Yeah, we, I finished uh, the one for our, our processing site, so we, we should have that back to you soon. Um, Eric, I did send you some updated facilities that I think you guys were missing, right? I, I think you had kind of an incomplete list there, so ho hopefully that helps you out a little bit. Um, Much appreciated. Ha happy to reach out to me if you need some good contacts with that. But, hey, Brad, we're, you know, for WM's perspective, we're, we're going to get our surveys back to you in a timely basis, but, you know, don't shoot the messenger some other haulers and processors that I spoke to um, don't think this is an adequate amount of time to get this done. So I'm just, if you guys want to have a good representative sample of the data, um, I, I don't think by next week you're going to have it. So just want to say that. And I'll jump in, this is John, nine from Publishers. We're working on it as well, but it requires a lot of information. So we might need just a little bit of time to complete it all. Uh, got it. Definitely uh, let us know on that um, because we have some pretty tight schedules yeah. um, at this point. Um, so, so, Brad, uh, let me let me just add. I'd really appreciate the effort that everybody is making to make sure we have up, up, updated data. And Eric, your comment. Uh, this is 2016. We want to get to as close as possible to recent date. That will be very important. But I just want to, um, you know, ask that we don't let perfection be the enemy of good. So this is a journey. As we get this data, let's keep updating. But, you know, there are timelines that are really going to bring discipline to this process. So I uh, appreciate all the work everybody's doing. And of course, Chris, I trust you can get as much data as possible. See you uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Prince George's County. Uh, your energy is something that we're going to be counting on. So don't just let uh, anything slow you down so we can get the right data as quickly. Hey, hey, it's not, hey, hey, Mike, it's not me. There's some other you know people out there that are, that are saying they're not able to pull it together. I'm just, I'm just giving you some feedback to do with it what okay. you want. But I mean, we, we'll be able to comply for sure. But I, I just want you to have not good data. That's all. Okay, okay. good. Hey, Thanks. And, and to that point, Chris and, and Mike, I, I appreciate that. Um, we the, the surveys that we sent out are uh, very detailed. Um, they do require um, counties, uh, haulers, MRFs to be following up with several people within what is a pretty large organization. Um, and so, I, you know, I really appreciate all of the effort that that takes, and we will, you know, do as best we can to stick and be diligent on our our timelines to to support what the state needs um, and balance that with getting as, as comprehensive and, and uh, uh, accurate data as, as we can. So not trying to shortchange the, the quality because want to make sure you have what you need to uh, bring to the legislature and be able to speak to that. Yeah, um, Martha, I think you had a, a question. Yes, hi. Um, I was asking a couple of questions. Will, will we know the total amount of each packaging material and type sold in the state at the end of the needs assessment? And my second question was, and thank you for circulating those um, questions for the cities and counties. I take it this, this train has already left the station. There's no opportunity to give feedback on the way these questions are being asked. Um, so the, the surveys are out already. Um, but as I said, and and uh, before, uh, we don't have to have everything finalized for legislation. We'll be having a lot more conversations before the plan and the regulations for um, EPR are actually established. Um, and the results of the um, so yeah, it, the, there will there will be more opportunities. Um, and and, and one thing, Brad, I saw what oh, you had sent ahead. out last night. That that was a preliminary list, while the the uh, 
the survey was still being reviewed um, and it doesn't reflect the the way that the questions were asked or the final questions themselves which which I could I'd be happy to provide um, to be able to send out to the group I'd yeah like they're, they're close that. but it, it, I was concerned about a question in there uh, that asked what are your rating on some scale your views of the EPR for packaging without actually describing what's in it and and it I was concerned because it was pretty much completely about getting money back <laughs> for your recycling and not you know not not all the different dimensions we could be exploring in this bill I mean we haven't gotten to the point about what the objectives of the bill are are we also interested in redesign are we also interested in reuse there's a there's a list of you know five or six different topics you could ask about and just saying the EPR for packaging doesn't tell the respondent what it is you really you know what element of it that that they approve of or disapprove of or, or would prioritize that was my main concern so I'm interested in how that question if you could send around you know the list of questions actually asked that would be helpful thank you hey um I'd like to jump in really quickly and just say that I think that that updated list is post posted to the EPR web page okay. at the moment just so that everyone was aware and the uh... Um, the list that we sent out or that Eric is talking about has like the logic, like if you answer this, then you go down this. So mm -hmm. we wanted to boil it down to something that was a little bit more uh, digestible. Uh, Ellen. Yeah, just to circle back to Michael's comment and just, you know, in our view, you know, a lot of these are very detailed. That is going to be important, but that doesn't mean that we can't have recommendations ready to move forward that establish the framework. That's how it's worked in other states. Even recently in Minnesota, there's a phased in approach. So, you know, my thought is, and, and this is just my opinion, we can make a recommendation on there will be an EPR system. This will be the governance or, or you know, this is, you know, begin to, this is what a recommendation is, would be in governance. This would be, for instance, the, the Maryland government's role, like MES will be, you know, the authoritative thing, you know, begin to have those conversations and then as the data comes in, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, we can move through, but there's no reason why going into this assembly, I believe, this is just my opinion, that we shouldn't be able to build a, fr a strong framework. Are we going to be able to make a recommendation on whether organic, you know, I, I don't want to be, whether food composting is going to be part of that. Um, you know, maybe, you know, those are the kind of things that I think come from the establishment of the EPR system, the establishment of the pro, the establishment of the governance, the establishment of who's in and who's out. And then those kind of things may be what I'm going to call phase two or phase three. You know, there's probably three strong phases here that may be, you know, frameworked in piece of legislation, but not detailed in the legislation. So. I'm, if I say I'm anxious about trying to move forward on what's the EPR governance look like, have that debate, have open discussion, make a recommendation. I am, you know, this report's due December 1st, not December 31st, I don't think. I might be wrong on that. And um, that's why I just, I continually try to circle back to focus the eye here, even if we can bite off, just saying, bite off a good governance um, structure that we all agree on. To me, um, that is... Uh, success. I would think that would be success. I, I, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. So the report was due July 1st of this year. Um, but I think of recommendations from the EPR Advisory Council I thought were due December 1st, but you're right. I'm, I might be totally have the timeline wrong. Or up to I would have to take a look. It might have been, um, yeah, I'll have to take a look at that because there are two separate types of recommendations. Um, so uh, we are shooting um, for uh, around the end of the year, uh, hopefully before the legislative session starts. Um, again, with our funding being uh, uh, removed from this, um, we had a delayed start um, in the implementation, and Eric is doing a fantastic job. Uh, as we showed in the uh, previously, the Gantt chart has like six or seven different 
concurrent activities that are all happening at the same time. So it's a pretty complex um, project and uh, we're working to deliver that as quickly as possible with a high level of quality. Um, any other questions on the needs assessment update? Kelly? Hey, yeah, I just, um, one of the pieces that's in the needs assessment, I, I think in the RFP was um, an analysis of the potential environmental impact for waste reduction and reduced environmental damage. And I know we've talked a little bit about greenhouse gas impacts and environmental damage. And I'm thinking specifically from Trash Free Maryland's perspective, also litter and you know things that don't get collected in the waste stream and reduction of overall generation. And I haven't had a chance to review the, the detailed questions, but I'm just curious if the needs assessment will, how it will address the environmental damage um, yeah. and so overall the, volume reduction. So for that part, what we did when we submitted the RFP, we essentially copy pasted like what was in the law and then expanded on those items on that. And then the work plan that we sent out um, Tasks one through 12 or whatever are those same sections in the law as well. And then, so I'd probably turn to Eric on, on that. The questions themselves don't necessarily get at that because that's a different task, but Eric, I'd turn over to you um, on that part. Sure. Yeah. So just to make sure I'm understanding the question, Kelly, um, you're wondering how the environmental impacts of waste reduction as it relates to kind of where waste reduction currently stands in the state compared to what the future state of Maryland with EPR would look like and how the, it, making sure that the environmental benefits of additional waste reduction as a result of EPR are being considered and, and quantified. Is that, did I get that? Yes, yeah, and, and beyond, um, beyond recycling, you know, and th this is where you would get to the future. Um, we talked about having an adaptable framework, right, where the future we could build in, reuse, refill, those kinds of things. We're not there yet, but um, it, having a good baseline. And I know that we don't have that granular level of data and we don't need that for our framework, but I think it does inform the objectives that we set for the framework, which is really pertinent to the initial phase, in my opinion. Like what is the goal of this pro um, this program that we're going to set up and then evolve over the next five to ten to twenty years? But sure. setting the goal as increasing recycling is different than setting the goal as reducing damage from packaging to the environment or people in Maryland. So, sure. so, so Eric, let me be actually take this. Um, uh, Kelly, I really like your question because that is important. It cannot be one or the other is both it's not just about recycling it's also about also reducing packaging impact on the environment very well said by the way let me remind all of us the state is on a journey to net zero you all know that right and let me give you some statistics this is on average packaging when it comes to climate impact mostly scope three contributes anywhere from eight to eleven percent there is absolutely no way you can decarbonize the planet if you don't decarbonize packaging, okay? And I gave a talk at the uh, Packaging Recycling uh, Summit um, last, I think it's last month or early this month uh, in, in, in California. I was trying to make sure that people understand that what we're doing and what I call additive impact. And if we mitigate things, we can address even the environment. So it has to be both. We can't segregate that, Kelly. That's why I really like your question. But this is something to put as an overarching guidance, is that packaging contributes anywhere from 8 to 11% uh, uh, of our uh, carbon footprint in scope 3, which is the one that is critical. And most CPG companies understand this. And uh, so I hope that gives you an idea, uh, Kelly, why we need to do both. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Mike. And just Kelly to to try and respond to kind of how in our scope we're addressing um, what I'll call uh, reuse or waste reduction. 
um, is evaluating the current infrastructure, um, the existing source reduction program through MRA law, as well as existing reuse uh, companies and programs across the state currently to set a baseline. Um, and then in our modeling effort, uh, we'll be evaluating the uh, kind of baseline economic, environmental, and kind of operational um, components of the recycling system, including the existing reuse. And then we'll, what we'll plan to do with this committee is to host a scenario planning workshop, which in that we'll look to make decisions on what is being modeled for a potential future state. And, and the idea there is to really help with the program planning for EPR. So uh, to Brad's point, it may be that, and, and, and I think um, Ellen's as well, um, being able to have this committee develop recommendations to support the upcoming legislative effort may be a bit separate from the recommendations from the needs assessment, um, which will be more, I guess, technically driven. Um, so that's, that's how I'm, I, I mean, to answer your question, yes, we're definitely including reuse. Um, but that, that's kind of our approach um, in terms of, of how that's going to be incorporated based on the scope that Brad had sent out yesterday. Eric, you covered something I had in mind, and I appreciate that. And that is that we got to get to a scenario uh, uh, planning um, because that will allow us to identify risks and opportunities and, of course, create uh, an avenue for impact mitigation okay so please that's a major thing we need to cover as a group this council uh, before we're all said and done because that to me sets the plan for what can happen in the future so we don't get mired into what we know today thanks yeah and um one one of our meetings that we're going to be scheduling um probably in uh, uh in, in the coming months is going to be talking about the inputs for the model and getting some consensus where we can on that. So, uh, yeah. Cool. All right. Any other questions, comments before we start delving into the, uh, the policy? All right. Okay, so um, last night I sent out a presentation and um, we're not gonna get through this uh, within uh, 25 minutes. This is intended to be the uh, discussion points for how we actually want um the proposed legislation uh to look like so um we talked a little bit about this and basically what i did except for this first slide is i copy and pasted what was in the uh the third reader um and put it on section uh for the slides and then uh, we can talk about how we would want to add modify or remove language in uh, that uh, particular text. Any questions on that? Cool, all right. So uh, the first one on here, uh, so the current state is uh, we have one producer responsibility organization. Um, through our uh, discussions and some of our presentations, um, we've seen some other models that were out there. So uh, the question for this is, do we wanna have uh, one pro? Do we wanna have multiple pros where uh, the, the producer essentially gets to pick and kind of shop for the best rates um, uh, to see uh, which pro would actually work for them. I think in Europe, they have 
froze by material and in Ontario, we heard a little bit about that, um, froze by material. Um, uh, or uh, do we want to have um, multiple pros with the option of individual producer responsibility, um, which uh, was uh, how Ontario is currently setting up their new system. And uh, Peter, uh, who represents the AA, our current pro, uh, would love to hear your uh, 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 your feedback on this. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Brad. I, and I just really wanted to provide clarification. So um, Ontario system is really just a multi pro system. The difference, the fundamental difference is instead of a program plan approach, the government sets direct targets that pros need to meet, whether they do that individually or through a pro. Um, so th that's really the difference. The, the functionality within the legislation is, is either a plan-based approach or it's uh, a, a straight government set target approach. So the, so just to clarify, like the, the plan or in the third reader of uh, Senate Bill 222, it says CAA will submit a plan that has these items in here and these goals. Um, instead, in Ontario, the law is here are the items you need, here are the goals you need to meet, and tell us how you're going to do it. And they don't have to tell them how they do it. They need to prove that they're meeting the regulatory requirements. I see. So there's, okay. there's no plan approval. Um, um, and you know, some of that is is based on the fact that Ontario has had, you know, traditionally a long you know, plan, program plan, uh, background, so that, you know, there's a, a, a lot of data to understand how to set uh, outcomes within Ontario. Got it, understood. Uh, Scott, you had some comments on this? Um, thanks, Bradley. I, well, I saw Ellen's question about whether you're just going through the topics or whether we actually are in an open uh, we're we're an open uh, open discussion okay. right now. Um, yeah, I, you know our view on this is that we understand why the producers want you know some ability to funnel in on one pro for gathering up all the producers and figuring out what the responsibilities are and getting them you know organized. Uh, most of the states allow have some off ramp for uh, individual groups, individual. Uh, materials and in, in, you know folks to create and have an alternative as long as they're meeting the same goals that the state uh, applies for I think it would be responsible in a in a design system to allow for the opportunity for additional pros that the MDE approves that the state approves um, but you know Ontario seemed like it was the Wild West to me and was a little bit too much so I think there's a happy medium between one and 30 uh, which might be one plus a couple <laughs> opportunities for for specialized pros that perform a specific service or service you know certain materials. So one with the ability to opt out as long as you are meeting the goals that the state has the set. And I, and and even when um, Mary was talking about it, it sounded like most people like wanted to be in a pro. There's very few, if at all, individual producer responsibility um so. well the the oregon law in 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 its creation allowed for multiple pros but then set an arbitrary percentage of the market which made it hard for people to get enough to you know at one point early in the oregon process there was going to be the pro for curbside and the pro for depots but getting enough material organizing around you know getting enough market share to to meet the threshold that oregon had put in for arbitrary you know ability to create the second pro or to have a pro limited the ability of people of groups to come in and form additional pros uh and um i just from a structural theoretical standpoint bradley i'm just recommending that that Maryland keeps some flexibility to create some additional mechanisms to meet the obligations. 
Okay. Um, Ellen, I think you're next. Yeah, I, I, I guess I was a little confused on the format because I thought if we're open discussion on um, authority and pro, I'll just tell you, we think there should be one pro, understand the importance of an off-ramp. We think MES should be the governing body that has some authority, you know, is the government oversight. And we think the pro has to be um, away from any kind of government um, ability to interfere with use of funds. Um, an example would be, everybody's going to smile, um, uh, that that it really needs to be independent, and when funds are um, collected, that it has to be um, uh, used for uh, the good of the order. So, you know, we think it has to be independent. Money can't be seized like the used tire trust fund. We think MES is probably more suitable from a government um, entity oversight of the pro. So um, that's how we feel today. I, again, Bradley, I, I'm, I didn't. Oh, I, I would have been more prepared. I think it would be helpful to get a sample of all um, laws that have passed and then, you know, what that pro is in, in the United States, maybe. Um, but that's our position. And single pro, understand the off-ramp or the out years. Once it's seated, the ability is established and it has to be separate and apart from any kind of government um, uh, established within the government. Thanks. Thank you. And just so I, I was clear, MES, Maryland Environmental Service, would be the oversight? Uh, you know, I mean, I think we're getting way out of, out of our skis. But, yeah, I do think that there should be one pro. I understand the off-ramp conversation once everything is established. And the pro has to be held separate and apart, established. And then we think MES, um, this is just is, is better suited to be um, the overseer of the funds of the pro um, uh, that's what we think is is probably um, the better case. Nobody wants a new government. I, I don't. Can I strike? Nobody wants. People may want. I. We cannot support a a gov a, a government fund like the Tire Trust Fund acting as the EPR fund. Um, so um, that's our position. I think we can spend time thinking. Then what's the authority of the pro? Then what's the authority of uh, MES or the government oversight. Um, I think that's the framework. You know, we just get on the framework, um, and I think it has to look like uh, programs in the United States um, that that have moved forward. Thank you. And uh, we'll get at it. It's in the presentation. So as the third reader um, currently reads, the fund is managed by CAA um, and MDE. Um, sure has the enforcement and oversight. So, sure. so uh, CAA will be responsible for taking in fees and then redistributing them to counties, uh, other recycling infrastructure, stuff like that. Yeah, and, and just, just for clarifying too, I just want to clarify because I know the last, the last presentation, I thought rather than go through the bill, we were going to go through the framework chunks because the bill you know, would, would become cumbersome. What is the authority? Who is the government? How is the government oversight work? What materials are covered? What's the timeline for, um, for um, uh, 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 packaging plans, uh, pro-approval plans? And then what's the timeline to be able to release money? So um, a little unprepared today, but just to spit back out, we think one pro, government oversight, we think it should be MES, and um, I think um, open discussion on out-year off-ramps for, for um, producers, for yes. sure. And uh, the next slides are um, copy and pasted from the third reader, uh, so hopefully we can get to those. Or, or we will be getting to, uh, I think, some of the items that you're talking about as well. Hey, hey Brad, um, I think to Elian's point, uh, he, somebody has in the chat is mes a government agency because you can't have a non-government agency being the oversight at the same time so yeah they you? yeah they're they're quasi government agency that the general assembly has some authority over um as well i just you know maybe i'm a little uh jaded from uh, uh government funds and and government oversight and and, and the government have the ability to seize the money, Michael, uh, should they want to use it for, let's say, a, a, a another source. So 
Um, yeah. MES is, I think, would be a good landing, uh, a good landing spot. Just a recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate the recommendation. The, the point is, we don't want the government spending the money that uh, uh, the, the manufacturers are contributing on something else. This we don't want another main example. So I, I agree that we should have the money managed independent of the government, but the government has to have an oversight. Otherwise, it won't work. And so that's one recommendation as we go forward. Yeah. Um, Abigail Stein. Hey, yeah. Um, so from our perspective, uh, finding an in-between um, where if it's not a must be only one PRO, but allowing flexibility for additional PROs to be an option, um, particularly because some of what we're doing here is, is we're talking about framework, we're talking about structure, but we're, we're referencing other state programs that are not in effect yet, and we don't know what's going to work and, and what isn't, because none of them are, you know, fully in existence, and there are lessons potentially to be learned, both from our work and from those other states. And so creating too much rigidity and saying it must be one PRO now, I think is more of a hindrance than a benefit. Um, I would also say that I think that there needs to be some sort of government oversight um, in the program, something where it's answerable to government structure. But I, I am in agreement. There are a lot of instances in Maryland where general funds are rated for other purposes. And so creating whatever structure is necessary to make sure that, you know, fees that are collected are specifically going to um, the purpose of this program and not to completely separate um, projects is, is valuable. Um, and I would just note that I think in most of these, it would be better to be saying these are the factors or these are the structures that we want it to do as opposed to naming specific entities um, when they're not, you know, a government agency because, you know, this is legislation that's going to exist for however many years into the future and locking ourselves into a position where it has to be a specific entity that maybe, you know, exists in a completely different way in the future, I think is, is going to create a level of, um, you know, needing legislation um, and an intervention when, you know, we're talking about a 90-day a legislative cycle. Um, I think it just creates more harm than good if we're locking ourselves in on elements like that. Uh, Abigail, right. so your, your point is very well taken. And I think uh, more importantly is uh, um, the idea of having more than one pro is, is very important. Um, there are market forces also that would allow people to compete with one another. So you can't do that when you have only one pro. And to be honest with you, even in countries where you have major uh, uh, progress or major successes, like in, I use France as an example, they have more than one pro in the framework. But it turns out one of the pros, CTO, is the dominant one and has really overshadowed the rest of them. That's what market does. And we're a business. This is not a, we're not a non-profit, we're a business. So market forces has to come into place. So I think the idea of having the framework, remember we're talking about the framework, having uh, more than one PRO is reasonable. Yeah, and early on we received um, feedback uh, about, and, and this is why we're asking the question, um, and, and you heard a little bit about it in Mary, um, Mary's uh, from Ontario's presentation about letting the pro pick the rate that they are getting. So those are the market forces, but they are still responsible for meeting the goals uh, that are set forth in law. Uh, so I'm going to move to the next, uh, the next uh, Dan Felton. Yeah, thank you, Bradley. And I just wanted to clarify, maybe stating the obvious, but to take a step back, whether or not there's a single pro or eventually maybe multiple pros that, and probably the third reader on SB222 says this, but it's 
a mayor pin's position is it should be a nonprofit. Uh, that's what we have seen emerge in the U.S. That's what CAA is. But just to take a step back in any legislative recommendations, um, I you know it would be the preference for it to be a nonprofit. That's not necessarily the case in every jurisdiction around the world, but it is an it's an important distinction. Thanks, Bradley. And I and I think the third reader also does have some off ramps, but that was uh, mixed. Um, so we're we're just opening up the uh, the conversation again. By the way, Brad Dan uh, Dan was uh, on point there. It has to be absolutely. It has to be a nonprofit. And I think that that's a good um, yeah. That's good. Um, who's next, Chad? Chaz, you're mute. Chaz, you're still muted. Ah, there it is. There yeah. it is. Um, I think there's some fundamental questions that sooner or later need to be considered about the, the, the PRO, and I thought the idea of the nonprofit is, is absolutely essential because it gets into the question of who owns the PRO and what is its governance structure. What is the relationship between all the companies who will be paying fees? And for that matter, how many companies will be paying fees to this Maryland PRO? A thousand, twelve hundred, two thousand? And will they have any say in its operations? Or will they simply be writing a check and that's that? And I think, by the way, it was very clear in, in the uh, bill that the Senate passed that the, the money uh, that, that the, the ratepayers play goes into a separate fund uh, that, that's pretty much of a lockbox fund. Hey, Charles, you, you bring up a good point. Um, so the idea, and that's something we probably need to think about in the framework, is to have the, uh, uh, the nonprofit, it doesn't matter whether it's one, PR or, or two or three, it doesn't matter. That nonprofit organization has to have a board, a governing board, right? That governing board will include people that pay the money into it. Otherwise, it is not in the interest of everybody. So that's what we need to think about. But you, you that's a very good call out. Companies should have, it doesn't have mean all companies, by the way, just representatives of companies should be uh, having an oversight as well on the PRO or PROs. All right, Scott. Oh, thanks. I was actually typing my response. Shannon uh, kind of answered the question that MES does not have regulatory oversight. I understand the concern. If there is a concern about the the state grabbing funds and agree completely that this program needs to be, uh, you know, separate and you know the the funds for the program dedicated to the performance of the program. Um, but if MES is more likely based on the other states that i've seen and the stakeholder conversations and the definitions likely to be a service provider or in that category than than a regulator so it probably can't serve as the role for the regulatory body uh as was suggested um uh but i agree completely on the 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 separation and the protection of the funds and the program and to chaz's question um I think it's a big mistake if we're just shifting who pays for the program and not improving the performance of the program. So, thanks. So um, uh, I'll let Peter go. Peter, right, we have, have one a, minute left, by the way. Uh, sorry, I know we're almost at time, and, and so I was just going to ask the question. Um, so I, I had a number of questions. I mean, I, I wasn't involved in, in the initial drafting of it, and so there's a number of questions that I have as we go through each of these as to what was the intent, you know, um, uh, of some of the, the pieces in this. And I guess I'm just wondering for practical purposes as we have these conversations, is it helpful for us to send those types of questions in ahead of time like how how what's the best way as we move this one forward 
So um, the third reader, and Gabby might be able, if she's still on, might be able to um, expand a little bit on those uh, negotiations. And there are a lot of folks that were in here. There was um, one pro with the ability to off ramp, have it be, it was a nonprofit. The fund is under, would be under CAA. And then it went to committee and then was changed to one pro. And so, sorry, sir, Brad, I, I'm not meaning well, to inside them. I just mean throughout, you know, like, you know, like, you know, there's an exemption. I'll, I'll give you an example. There's an exemption for refillable uh, propane cylinder. Oh. I guess I partly wonder, like, is that because they're refillable? Is it is that the issue, or is it the issue that they're potentially hazardous in the thing? So I'm just I just don't necessarily fully understand what the purpose was and why things are are set up the way that they are. So understanding some of those things may may help to sort of understand how how it was crafted and maybe potentially what changes may may be helpful. So I know there's a lot of input from a lot of different stakeholders. Uh, where some of those changes. Uh, may have happened. So it's I, I wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you the bill sponsors might um, would give you be able to give you some more insight. But we are going to be walking through each of those items. And if there was someone who had asked for that change, then maybe we can understand the thinking. But there were multiple iterations of this. Um, and uh, feedback from different stakeholders and stuff like that. And Brad, um, it looks like we are uh, almost at time. Um, it's one minute left, so maybe we should uh, wrap up. But I'd like to say, first of all, this has been a very productive conversation, and I thank everyone. I just want to really appreciate uh, Scott, uh, uh, Abigail, Kate, Alex, Vinny, Peter, Eric, of course, and uh, of course, Chris, my good friend. I think. Uh, you and Ellen uh, really appreciate all of that. I wanna say that um, this is the type of conversation we need to have, uh, really very collegial, and I appreciate that. So with that, Brad, could you wrap us up? Yeah, yeah, and that is the intent to have this type of conversation, a little bit less on presentations, although we do have a couple more um, at, for the remaining of our meetings. Um, so with that being said, I am going to open it up to the public. If there's any uh, comments, uh, questions from the public, uh, now's your opportunity to do so. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next meeting, we're going to be looking at some data. So super excited about that. And then uh, take a look at this presentation. Um, it's not the entire third reader, so I might be adding those slides um, in as well. Um, so uh, be prepared to talk about it at our next meeting after the presentation. Cool. Hey, Brad, thanks so much. I'd be remiss if I don't say thanks for your leadership in this work. We really appreciate you, Bradley. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. Talk to you all later. Bye, Thank everyone. You.